Picture this. It's a 1700s, France. You're invited to a dinner party with prestigious guests. You show up to a lavish mansion and the room is busting with conversation. A man walks in, almost gliding, as if floating on air. He speaks in a way which you've never heard before. His eyes lock you in. He speaks of events hundreds of years prior with such detail you could swear he was there. Count Saint Germain mysteriously came onto the scene in France in the 1700s. The records would suggest that he may have been alive long before that, even during the times of Christ. French historian and philosopher Voltaire, King Louis, an Italian writer and adventurer Casanova, all claim to have known him. Voltaire even said, He's a man who knows everything and who never dies. Records do show that he was born in 1710 and died in 1784, but many people have claimed to have seen him since then, even as recent as 1970. He was a man with undeniable intelligence and wit. He captivated the elite with his knowledge and charms. He never seemed to age. He is said to have spoken six languages and was a brilliant artist. He could play the violin effortlessly and even grew diamonds. And yes, you heard that right. Count St. Germain was an alchemist, and a very accomplished one at that. This means he worked with turning metal into gold, creating beautiful jewels out of stones, and was in search of the fabled elixir of life. That may explain why he was so rich. He even trained other alchemists, including one under Marie Antoinette's rule. At her execution, the alchemist supposedly saw Count St. Germain, this was years after he was believed to have died. He wrote a book discussing his works with alchemy and symbols, but to this day some parts of it have yet to be decoded. He continued to travel all over Europe throwing magnificent parties. Guests claim that he's never taken a bite of food, and his elite guests marveled at his stories and were mesmerized by his entertainment. He eventually found himself in Germany, where he lived in a castle for a while as a confidant to the prince. He has one strange record of his death, which was written by a priest under the king's orders. He supposedly died in 1784, but many people don't believe this to be true. People continuously claim to have seen him, and the record of his death is very skim. It's rumored that he did not die and instead traveled to the west in order to promote spiritual fulfillment. His claimed first shop is in New Orleans. Some 200 years after the death of Count St. Germain, an immigrant from the south of France named Jacques St. Germain came to New Orleans and moved into a dwelling off of Royal Street. He was claimed to be known for his knowledge, charming wit, and seemingly ageless presence. He spoke of events that happened hundreds of years in the past with great detail, and he threw lavish parties with the finest foods, entertainment, and most prestigious guests, but never ate a bite of food. Sound familiar? No one questioned his seemingly immortal feel, but maybe they should have. Not long after he had taken up residence in New Orleans, things started to get really creepy. There's a tale told by many vampire enthusiasts in the Big Easy that one night Jack had a lady over to his home. He invited her over to a party with many up-and-comers and elites in New Orleans. After a while, he asked her up to the balcony and attempted to bite her neck. She freaked out and was able to distract him long enough to take the escape she had right off the balcony and to the pavement below. The story says that she was completely terrified and had drops of blood trickling down her neck. People quickly surrounded her and had the police there in no time. When police investigated the crime and went to Jacques' home to make sense of the incident, what they found made their hair stand on their neck. It said that they found clothes from all different time periods, stained in blood. There was absolutely no food, not even utensils in the house. There were many bottles of what seemed to be red wine, but were in fact human blood upon further inspection. What they didn't find was Jacques St. Germain, who never did return. Legend has it that Jacques was actually Count St. Germain, and people still see a man who looks similar all around the world. 
Back in 1704, the United States as it is today was very different. I mean, it technically wasn't even really the United States yet, so that should tell you something. A few cities that existed mostly along the coast were very newly established, and most colonists at the time were men. Obviously, this was an issue because these men didn't come all the way over here to die out, so they needed wives. At first, the city recruited potential mates for these men within their actual boundaries. They looked in jails and brothels. Needless to say, these women did not make very good wives for the largely religious colonists, so they had to look elsewhere. Over the years, plenty more people other than the original colonists had been sent over to populate the New World. Many were convicts or prostitutes, and made the journey against their will. But in 1704, the first of these three groups of girls arrived in what is now Mobile, Alabama, with one purpose in mind, to be wives for the colonists. These girls were usually between the ages of 14 and 19, and mainly chosen because they were virgins, usually from orphanages and convents. Another group was sent to Biloxi, Mississippi in 1719, another to New Orleans in 1728. Unfortunately, conditions on the ships were harsh, and many girls didn't survive the trip. But those who did were allowed to mingle with the men of the respective colonies and choose husbands from them. Unlike previous settlers, both the journey made up by these girls as well as their choice in husbands was consensual. Upon their arrival in the city, the New Orleans group experienced immense culture shock, as did the already established colonists. Often called Pelican Girls because of the ship they came in, they were noticeably pale. Many of them also coughed up blood and carried tiny bags with their earthly belongings inside. All New Orleans residents couldn't help but notice that these bags looked an awful lot like tiny coffins. Because of these bags, these girls came to be known as casket girls. The year before the casket girls came to New Orleans, a group of nuns had arrived. These nuns established a school that housed the casket girls as they looked for husbands. When the nuns, Ursuline Convent, was opened in 1734, the girls were moved to the third floor as they continued their search. The nuns would often arrange marriages for the girls, maybe if they couldn't find husbands on their own. But New Orleans residents were leery of the casket girls. Unlike most of the houses in the city, the windows of the third floor were shuttered and nailed shut, and after their arrival, the death toll in the city doubled. Pale skin, coffin-shaped bags, high death tolls, tightly closed and nailed shutters in a city that rarely had them. To New Orleans, it was obvious that the casket girls must have been vampires. But the reality of the casket girls wasn't so exciting. Many of the girls had trouble finding husbands, if they lived long enough to find them before succumbing to yellow fever or tuberculosis. The ones who did marry often didn't see their husbands for long periods of time since many of them were fur trappers or traders, careers that required lots of travel. According to the legend, the King of France grew tired of so many of the girls failing to find husbands and being forced into prostitution, so he ordered them to all be brought back home. But once the nuns got up to the third floor of the convent to get the girls, they were gone. They looked everywhere for them, but according to the legend, the windows had been sealed shut the entire time. This was when the vampire legend really kicked into gear. Interestingly though, Legends also say that the casket girls are still on the third floor of the convent, trapped inside, with nails blessed by the Pope. So why couldn't they be found when the nuns came to take them away? Did they come back at some point? Or is perhaps this just a contradiction in the story? In 1978, two paranormal investigators allegedly visited the convent to see if the legends were true. They were kicked off the property for loitering, but returned anyway to stay the night and see what happened. As they slept, security cameras showed the windows opening and shutting several times before they stopped working altogether. The next morning, the bodies of investigators were found on the property, ravaged and drained of blood. In 2013, 
An interview with a woman named Pam Keyes recalled a visit to New Orleans she made in 2001. Before going there, she knew about the legends of the casket girls and had heard that the third floor shutters being open meant that the vampires were out and about. That night, Keyes went for a walk by herself and as she walked by the convent noticed that the shutters were closed. But on her way back from the hotel, she walked past the convent again and the shutters were wide open. But the casket girl legends have more holes in them than anything else. For starters, the shutters on the third floor of the convent are hurricane shutters, not installed in the convent until a hundred years after the casket girls arrived. The nails couldn't have been blessed by the Pope either. No Pope visited New Orleans until Pope John Paul II in 1987. And the girl's paleness can easily be explained due to disease and being below deck on a ship for such a long time. Some of them contracted tuberculosis on the ship, might have even been infected upon arrival in New Orleans, which is probably why they were coughing up blood. But this legend of the casket girls persists today, as an interesting story, if nothing more. The old Ursuline convent is now actually a museum, and you can visit it and book a tour there, if you like. In the early 1930s, the Carter brothers, Wayne and John, were living what seemed to be just a normal life. They made their living in southern New Orleans, working each day at the docks, handling seafood and loading them on and off the boats. A few people knew the dark side of these lives. The hardships that they faced, including the fact that the brothers were not particularly human. They were considered by the town to be vampires. On an early morning in 1932, a young girl ran out onto what is St. Anne Street. She was covered in blood and her wrists had been slit. Police rushed to the young girl and took her to the nearest hospital. Upon further investigation, it was found out that her wrists were completely sliced open, but not with the purpose of killing her. Rather, they were sliced in just a way to allow the blood to drain slowly from her body. The young girl said that these men were vampires, feeding from her every night. In a confused panic, the police rushed to the house and broke in. Nobody was home. As they continued the investigation, they crept upstairs and they found 15 more bodies scattered across the rooms, each with similar cuts on their wrists. Many of them were pronounced dead at the scene while others had survived, including four other young girls. Because the Carter brothers were not home yet, the police decided to set a trap for the men. They set the officers up for an ambush to wait for John and Wayne. It's important to remember that the Carter brothers were not very big. They were about 5'6 at max, and weighing less than 160 pounds each. Yet somehow the brothers took out all the police officers, knocking four of them out before leaping off over the top balcony. They gracefully landed on the road below and ran off quicker than anything. This is something that would be impossible for a normal man. While they were very strong, they weren't very smart, as they decided to go to work the next day. Police surrounded and arrested them. A few days later, they were found guilty of murder and hanged in the town square. As talk of vampires grew, the town folk asked if the bodies be exhumed and investigated. They wanted to know why the brothers wished to drink blood. But when the coffins were raised only after a few weeks, they were found to be empty. Locals believed that the brothers never truly died and moved on to other cities to commit more of their heinous crimes. It's said that on an annual basis around Mardi Gras, the brothers returned back to their old home. The current residents have told stories of brothers who commonly make appearances. They spoke of an evening when they first purchased the home. Upon arrival, they noticed people out on the second floor balcony. Rushing out to yell at them, the figures leaped off the balcony and disappeared into thin air. <laughs> 